Gallery in Washington, studying oriental brushwork. This nine-foot watercolor, or scroll, is called plum branch. The Chinese and Japanese not only write, but paint, from right to left. To enjoy fully work by oriental artists would need a knowledge of their traditions. We must be content, however, with an appreciation of the quality of their brushwork. We also need a sense of the timelessness of nature, of trees and mountains, and of man's love for them. The whole last part of this branch was done with one continuous tapering stroke. The Chinese have been trained from one generation to another to make the brush respond to what the artist feels. In this grapevine in the wind, we know that the artist thought wind, and his hand and arm responded kinesthetically. For centuries, most oriental painting, and indeed writing too, has been with watercolor on silk, or on long fiber paper made of rice or mulberry. The brushwork sometimes takes the form of calligraphy, or picture-like strokes, and is full of symbolism. This is river landscape, painted on a long silk scroll in 1580 by Dai Chin. While it is too late for us to watch him or any other great master from the Ming dynasty at work, many living artists still paint in the same tradition. Given similar brushes, colors, skills, and emotions, years or centuries are easily bridged. This is Tyrus Wong, Chinese-American painter, at work in his Los Angeles studio. Here are his brushes, palette, and Chinese ink. He drags the wet brush across the edge of the palette, as Dai Jin did centuries ago. And now he writes the early character for tree or wood. If you wish to say grove, add another tree, and for forest, a third. The word for up is amusing when contrasted with the one for down. Here's the ancient character for the word horse. The mane, head, back, legs, and tail. The word has now been simplified to this. Mr. Wong is thinning the ink in preparation for the painting of a horse. He uses rice paper or ordinary American watercolor paper. The strength and purity of the lines that you are now seeing painted comes first from a profound contemplation of the import of each one. This brushwork is simple and significant. Not only does the artist eliminate everything not essential to movement, but he uses every device to convey action. While the heavy lines express power, the lighter ones suggest resilience. You even find yourself sharing the exuberant vitality of the animal. The signature is as beautiful as the rest, and the seal lends final authenticity to most oriental work. Let us pursue the path of the eye as it follows the artist's brush in The Blind Man, a story written in paint. The line emphasizes the bent back, the worn shoes, the road traveled, 
The cane is a symbol of lost way, and the cup begs for arms. Now that Mr. Wong has shown us something of his way of working, let me take you back 500 years before his time and show you a landscape done with similar restraint and purity. Centuries before Cezanne, this unknown artist created tension and depth by the use of planes and multiple horizons. He wasn't afraid to move his vanishing points about or to ignore them entirely. A modernist point of view from out of the past. Reproductions of this picture, by the way, are in most of the world's great museums. If this were music instead of painting, these quiet horizontals and smooth flowing lines might be the adagio movement, gradually preparing us for the final maestoso. The full orchestra would be needed to bring out the menace of these pinnacles and the drama of this towering escarpment. We now leave Chinese brushwork, its old history and its symbolism and expressiveness and pass on to Japanese painting, more recent but equally sensitive. The art of watercolor in China was the ancestor to that in Japan, so that it seems natural to find Gaho, a Japanese of the Kano school, painting these Chinese Taoist immortals with so much empathy. Another good example of this understanding is found in a winter party, painted by Utagawa Toyoharu in the 18th century. Whether it be a landscape or a portrait, the Oriental artist usually observes his subject for a long time before presuming to talk about it. He sometimes even identifies himself with it. A rich man once commissioned a painter to make a picture of a duck. After several months with no delivery, the artist excused the delay by saying, but sir, I do not yet feel like a duck. We share with the tea drinkers their delight in the view of snow-covered trees and gardens. And now, in another garden in this country, we shall actually watch Chiura Obata of the University of California painting a cypress tree. Though he sometimes uses rice paper or silk, he is now working on Hoshio paper from Japan. He is painting, as did his forebears, with sumi or black stick pigment, and often with the same kind of brush. The strokes must be significant and express the artist's deep appreciation of nature. Although the Japanese traditional painter sometimes uses color, his greatest delight is in the movement of the brush, and pitsu, as he calls it. Here, it speaks eloquently of the spiral strength of the bark or describes the foreground. As the blending brush flicks over the paper, trees appear in the distance, and then a bird in flight with two strokes. Who could have done that but an artist trained from boyhood to use a brush for writing as well as for painting? While painting, Obata tells me he is thinking the beauty of struggle of cypress trees at Point Lobos. They face the day and night sea wind.
Before touching brush to paper, Obata takes a deep breath and holds it while stroking. He doesn't use the wrist, but the whole body swings with the arm. This brush is known as a five-stroke hake. That stroke, surprisingly called wrinkles on a cow's neck, is a symbol for rocks, in this case granite cut by glaciers in the Yosemite. He now substitutes the blending brush for the hake. While I could describe the great variety of techniques you will now see, I prefer to let the brush talk. A Chinese proverb says, to hear about a thing a hundred times is not so good as to see it once. Coming from a race of great fishermen, Mr. Obata now turns his thoughts to a leaping trout. Instead of drawing the fish, he places dots to locate it on the paper. These colors are minerals ground in glue, yellow earth, peacock stone, iron rust, or oyster shell white. color and a little sumi for the back and spots, but the mark on the paper that seems to start with brown turns magically to an iridescent green. A warmer color for the belly of the fish. Malachite green and indigo blue on the hockey brush make the water splash as the trout jumps. A different feeling entirely from that of the falling water, of the rocks, or of the trees. These are the water wheel falls near Yosemite. I, for one, get less pleasure out of looking at a photograph or even the actual scene than I do from a fine painting of a subject, such as Obata's thundering Nevada Falls, painted on silk. The Oriental artist seeks not a copy of something, but an emotional release. But whatever the subject may be, or whenever the artist knelt to paint, from the Sung dynasty to the present, the world of art owes a special debt to the Oriental for his high level of taste and the distinction of his brushwork.